Well, we're here today with Chuck Klosterman, now the author of a new work of fiction, Downtown Owl. And first of all, Chuck Klosterman, for years I've been saying Klosterman. Does everybody get it wrong, or are you all now known as Klosterman with a long O? Well, clearly I'm not if you got it wrong. I got it wrong. I, uh, it looks like Klosterman. It is Klosterman, but yeah. I don't even correct people. Because yeah. it looks like Klosterman. There's no umlaut. There's not two O's. Right. And I don't really care that much, I guess. I yeah. suppose uh, uh, it, it, seems, it seems crazy to me to complain about the mispronunciation of your name when there's no logical reason to pronounce it any other way. Right. Yeah. Well, we're all there now. Chuck Klosterman, nice to have you at Borders. Thanks Great to be here. It is interesting being on television in a Borders. Yeah. It is this very strange, disconcerting <laughs> feeling. People who are watching this don't realize I'm surrounded by cameras, there's lights everywhere. No, you're just having a cup I, of coffee well, in the no, cafe. Here's the deal, I was gonna mention that. I'm not. I feel like I should be acting. This is actually water, so I think I'm going to, throughout this entire yeah. interview, <laughs> pretend that I'm drinking coffee. Mine's coffee. Jesus. No, I just want to point that out. Mine's real. Well, <sighs> see. But it's just very water. It's, be it's careful, just, hot. It's just, yeah, no. <laughs> It's like a screen well, test for eventually a role where I'll get to play. That's a, right. A, These people are all real, though. Every one of them. There's nobody here that's just not happening. I don't know that. <laughs> they, all right. I don't know, man. It's all real. Okay. It could be alternative universe. It could be the Truman Show or something. But. Well, Possible. your new book, Downtown Owl, you're writing fiction now. Mm. And uh, for your career has been up to now mostly, almost all nonfiction. I'm sure you've written some stories and things and some of your other works. but. What do you like better now? You've done them both. What do you like better, making stuff up or, or reporting on things that you've seen? Well, writing fiction is definitely much harder. Uh, it was much more difficult, because journalism and nonfiction is essentially a reactive art form. I mean, if I was doing a story about this conversation, I would just be able to look at you and sort of react to the color of your shirt and talk about your hair and sort of the way you're holding your hands. And, you know, I basically would look at this table and just pretty much describe that it's round and all these things that are just sort of the natural inclination to sort of being curious about the world. But with fiction, you have to create everything. It's a creative art form. So it's hard to make a table or it would be hard to like make you. You know, I have to make you in my mind yeah. to write about you. So it's, it, I can probably write 5,000 words of nonfiction in the time it takes me to write 500 words of fiction. So it's much slower, much more difficult. But, uh, it, you know, it is, I guess, a little liberating because if you just, you know, if you just want something to happen, it can just occur. You just yeah. want someone to be I attacked by a bear. I think that's what fiction bear. writers yeah. like. I think the people who write it, it's a new discipline, obviously, for you, but I think what I hear most from fiction writers is if they want it to rain in their world, they can make it rain. Here's like the problem, power. though. Here's the thing. That... Um, you know, when you're writing about real life or you're sort of just sort of responding to what's actually happening, there really are less rules in reality. I mean, truth, as they say, you know, is stranger than fiction. That's absolutely true. If you're having a conversation with somebody and you're just recording the dialogue, somebody might say something totally non sequitur, something that makes no sense whatsoever, something that seems unnecessarily insulting or bombastic, and you just record it because people do that. But if you place that in a fictional context, you're always worried about knocking people out of their sense right. of reality. Doesn't so make in sense. a way you've actually got to, you, you know, whenever I was trying to create a conversation or create a person or a scenario, whatever, you're always sort of worried that does this seem plausible? Where in life we just accept implausibility. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely like when you're creating that world, it may not seem real at all, even though what, what happens. But like if you, you create a set. world that doesn't seem real, it's bad. If you talk about the world and it seems unreal, it's awesome. So you, you obviously then were able to find some way to sort of do that and you found these characters. Are these people that you might have known in your life? Is that how you write your fiction? I mean, you find people that you've known and sort of funnel them into these characters? Well, in this, because this was the first time I had done fiction and I didn't even know if I could do it, I, I thought to myself, I need to have a town that I have an understanding of. So the town in this book isn't my hometown, but it's like my hometown and like a lot of the towns that were around it in North Dakota. They were, a lot of it are kind of like, almost like fragments of towns from friends of mine when I went to college and met these people in, in Grand Forks. I picked 1983 and 1984 because of two real events that happened, a blizzard in 84 and um, a, a murder that happened in 83. So they were kind of like the the pegs that this narrative would be built around. Um, but outside of that, I mean, you know, it's, it, they're just kinds of people I feel like that could inhabit a town like this. They're not 
there's nobody in this book that is like, well, this is just like my friend Steve, or you know, or this is just like my aunt or whatever. There's yeah. nothing like that. Um, but uh, they're probably certainly. Uh, situations that characters are in are situations I remember people talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, El uh, so Owl is a uh, is a town that you created, but it's obviously a return to North Dakota for you. You've gone to many places since Fargo, Rock City came out, your first book, and done a lot of things since then. How long has this idea been bouncing around in your head to write a work of fiction about North Dakota? I think what probably happened was this. When I was probably 16 or 17 or 18, if you would have said, what is your goal in life? I probably would have said to write a novel. I think anybody who's interested in writing at one point thinks it would be really great to, I mean, that's the ultimate kind of obstruction. It's like a long form story where you create everything starting with nothing. But then I fell into being a journalist and that actually became, was much more natural to me and I enjoyed it much more and I sort of assumed I would, uh, you know, just work in the newspaper industry my whole life. Uh, so I spent about eight years or maybe ten years basically talking about culture through the eyes of other people, having people tell me their experience and putting that into a context. Then I spent about five years writing about really about myself. So then I got to this point where I wanted to write about people who had never existed. And that kind of probably goes back to the original motivation of writing a novel when you're 16. And then, as I said, I just, because I was just very nervous about doing it, I wanted to sort of put it in a scenario and under conditions that I could kind of feel like I had a, a, like a real vivid understanding of. I mean, I could have, I suppose, placed this book in a small town in Oklahoma. I could have went to a small town in Oklahoma and I could have researched that community and it probably would have been mostly correct. But the things that you miss are the details that you don't even realize right. are things you need to be wary of. You know, yeah. like what kind of pop people are drinking at a certain time or, or you know, how kids... Uh, what, what was what was on the radio at that time, you know, because just because, you know, something, what was playing on the radio in Fargo in 1983 probably was not the same of what was being played in even like you know, Boise, Idaho in 1983. There had been some AOR songs that would cross over, but there's a uniqueness and a singularity to every place. Yeah.